This is the EWN Podcast Network. Welcome to Late Boomers, our podcast guide to creating your third act with style, power, and impact. Hi, I'm Kathy Worthington. And I'm Mary Elkins. Join us as we bring you conversations with successful entrepreneurs, entertainers, and people with vision who are making a difference in the world. Everyone has a story, and we'll take you along for the ride on each interview, recounting the journey our guests have taken to get where they are, inspiring you to create your own path to success. Let's get started. Hello, I'm Kathy Worthington. Welcome to our latest episode of Late Boomers. Today, our special guest is coming to us from Ireland, and I'm going to let him say his name. My name is Michal O'Sullivan. I love that. He's a renowned poet, singer, and speaker from Limerick, Ireland. He's a master of several worlds of music and poetic performance and composition. His way in the world exists between laughter and poignancy. And I'm Mary Elkins. From a family steeped in Irish traditional music and academia, Michal gravitated to performance early, beginning as a drummer. He studied music at University College Cork. He graduated with an MA in ethnomusicology at Irish World Academy of Music and Dance before teaching as a freelance music educator with a specialization in rap and human beatboxing, which is vocal percussion. Let's hear from him in his own words. Welcome, Michal. Well, hello, everybody. Hello from Ireland. It's, uh, it's, it's uh, just early evening here, and it's really great to be with you both. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Fill Wonderful in, to have you. Fill us in a little more, please, on your roots and early inspirations that led, led you to where you are today. Well, I, I, am, I have a foot in a couple of worlds, uh, Kathy. Um, my mother is a great spiritual singer, a great academic in the world of <laughs> um, sacred song in the Irish language, a musicologist. Ooh. And she met my father in college, in the University College Cork, back in the early 70s. And uh, both of them really created a, a fireball relationship where they immersed themselves in Irish traditional culture and Irish traditional music. And really, uh, our fusion musicians, where they brought Irish traditional music and uh, and the Irish language into contact with uh, other world music cultures like classical music and a bit of jazz and um, and really that's and 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 sacred song as well. So I went to a elementary school in in County Limerick, very much rural Ireland, very much uh, your typical national school or elementary school we call them here, and. Uh, then I went to boarding school, of all things, uh, luckily, in a very uh, prestigious boarding school, actually, in County Limerick, just up the road from me, called Glenstall Abbey. And Glenstall Abbey is a Benedictine boarding school in, in the wilds of County Limerick in Ireland, and uh, a very artsy place. And uh, I was uh, ushered toward singing um, in the choir and picked up a bit of Gregorian chant. Now, Gregorian chant is a Latin form of Catholic music. And uh, really? maybe, mm -hmm. um, well, it's all over Catholic and Protestant culture. But mm -hmm. uh, I picked up a, a, a tradition of that just from singing in the choir. But of course, I only tried to sing in the choir so that I didn't have to dress up in my suit and tie <laughs> on Sundays. You know, I threw on uh, the stole or the, uh, the alb, as they call it which is the long flowing gown that the choristers and young, uh -huh. innocent, cherubic lads like myself. And uh, <laughs> I really discovered a great friend uh, in my own voice early. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, and really because of the inheritance and the apprenticeship that my relationship with my parents created, uh, I really saw every genre or tradition of music as the same, um, whether it was rap and hip hop, which I gravitated toward. Of course, I, as, a, as, a, as an early teenager, I had to abstract my identity as far away from my parents as I possibly mm -hmm. could. And I, and I endeavored to become a rock star uh, rapper, um, which was thankfully I never got signed. You know, when you have those moments in your life where you look back and you thought that was what you wanted. But 
you thank your lucky stars that uh, it, it wasn't what you got. And uh, so the music industry beckoned after school, you know, and I started singing songs with my brother. And I often accredit really. So as a singer, we're spoiled. You know, it's the most immediate art form one can have. Um, people really, uh, it's a very primal and ancient um, space when you sing for someone, you know, and not everyone can handle it, actually, when somebody sings a cappella um, in a room. Some people find it uh very intimate you know it's very uh immediate and it's very physical you know to sit and listen to someone it's it's definitely got everything and some people at different points in their lives find it uncomfortable and um and i learned that the hard way i was always uh, uh, in a sense singing at parties and things and throughout my life then as well i i was guilty of kind of pushing at uh, the moment trying to create a moment um it, through my voice as well um where, do you know, when we have that gift inside of ourselves, mm -hmm. we're just so eager to give it that um, that we almost go against the very nature of the art form because the singer must be asked or invited to sing, you see. Mm -hmm. um, and that, it, it, that, there's a lesson in that for all of us as well, you know, that, that that waiting and waiting until our gift is invited is part Ooh. of a, a life well lived. So most of us end up waiting around far too long, as many of your listeners will know. Uh, but when the moment comes uh, and true. you've done your work and you've done your your uh, you have your patient relationship with your with your art form or with your virtuosity or with your gift, uh, it is all the more appreciated. So I was why able to go oh, on. I, I was curious why Ireland is synonymous with art and music and creativity. It, really seems to invite that. It does. There's a great history of it. And at the end of every night, of course, Mary, we do sing. You know, everyone's invited to sing. And if you sing the same song twice, that's OK, uh, as long as as long as we don't have to go home. So there's always <laughs> a great tradition. There's always a great tradition of singing in the homes, you know, and uh, and we really communicate through the, through those songs and, of course, those poems. Uh, and poetry is also then a the most recent art form that I have apprenticed myself to. I'm a, it, I'm I'm suppose in my midlife. Uh, I'm 39 years old in my 40th year, and um, uh, so I'm learning little bits along the way. And it's really wonderful to speak to two wise ones such as yourself and many of your listeners, no doubt, and some of the very wise younger listeners who are listening in because we learn a lot. But um, the the poetry and the song is something that we communicate with, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, and those like we we acknowledge and confront many of the griefs and the joys that we all share. So there's a great courageousness that's adopted uh, through the songs. Like there's a great song that I've learned from my mother and uh, called Once I Loved. And it's a great song of longing. Of course, the Irish have a great sense of confronting that shared longing that we all have. And I'll give you two verses of it right now. That'd be really. lovely. Very a nice, quick version of it. And that's from the Cain sisters. It's called Once I Loved. And it's really about the grace and uh, the letting, the grace in letting go. Once I loved with deep affection one whose thoughts were dear to me. But now there's been a dreary parting. Nevermore will you speak to me. Go and leave me if you wish to. Never let me cross your mind. And if you think I've proved unworthy, go and leave me, I don't mind. And see this ring, love, that you once gave me, when our hearts, they were entwined, well, give it to your dark-haired lover. Never tell that it once was mine. Go and leave me if you wish to. Never let me cross your mind. 
And if you think I've proved unworthy, go and leave me, go and leave me, go and leave me, I don't mind. Bravo. Oh. I, I would clap, oh, so but I don't know if it screws up our sound if we clap. <laughs> no worries. But well, I, but I, I have to say I'm crying. I don't know why. Well, it's a very, very moving lyric. Yeah. It is. It is. And, and I can... I can... I can include a a, 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 a version of, of YouTube maybe that where I learned it from, but it does acknowledge that time to go, you know? So uh-huh. we there's two times in our lives, once when we have to go and once when we, when we must release others. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's not the end of the world, you know, in, in the Irish tradition when you have to leave something or you have to let something go. There's a, of course, geographically, Ireland is on the edge or was on the edge of the known world for, thousands of years and uh-huh. uh, traditionally it, it it is a place where people come to rediscover or to let go of old stories and of course that's very easy when there's all the old castle ruins from the relatively uh-huh. recent past and then of course there's a prehistoric history here in Ireland of stone circles and other um, tombs um, and passage graves that are aligned with the sun um, astrologically that are that are signs of a very advanced um civilization here so that that all seeps mm. in you know when i was running around my elementary school in in county limerick and you're seeing the little mounds on the horizon and little bumps in the hills and you're wondering was that a settlement you know two to two thousand five hundred to mm-hmm. five thousand five hundred years ago so even at the back of my mother's house actually there's a a garon bon a, a, it's called a, but a garon is a is a is a mound or or one of those they think it's a burial site, but it really could have been a defensive structure for a little uh-huh. fort on the top of it. As well, well, to so. change the subject a tiny bit, I mm. need to ask you, what is Irish rap music? <laughs> Good question. Well, rap music is a global culture. It's a beautiful hip hop culture. Of course, uh-huh. rap music is part of a hip hop culture and hip hop culture spread like wildfire. Um, in the late 80s and early 90s in Ireland, and England and France is a great progenitor of hip hop culture as well. And hip hop culture has a couple of different elements. Uh, it's got choreography, which is the break dancing. Um, it's got visual art, which is the graffiti. Uh, it's got literature, which is the rap lyrics. Um, it's got technology. It's uh, the first ever global technological traditional music, believe it or not because it's almost, you have to plug it in before you can play it. It's the world's first electronic music. Yeah. And um, so it has all of these elements running at the same time to create a community. Um, migrants love hip hop as well. So people, a lot of migrants and immigrants who travel to different countries will choose hip hop as a, as a mode of communication and really a way of communicating their own identity. Mm. Because you take... American hip hop culture and you put in your own slang and you put in your own uh, references and your, your own specificities. Uh, does it sound so the like, same? It does sound the same. Well, you're supposed to use your own accent, but there are some Irish rappers who use an American accent and that's, that's also very valid. But I mean, when I was, when I was younger, the, the one of the raps I wrote was, uh, um, I have a nickname, which is Moly, you know, uh, from Wind in the Willows. It's a, it's a childish childhood name and um so like i used that and i, I went like yo the name is moly now i'll be keeping it underground when the lyrics abound when me and the late boomers we be getting down yo i got to teach it now i don't preach it i'm up on the podcast now you know that i'm an idiot i'm not cynical i've almost reached the pinnacle now i'll be studying beats and i'll be getting socio-political are you getting this i really don't think you should bet in this my style enters your arm like a shot now for tetanus now you're begging it won't happen to you kids because when i be under my gutter mcs you they be legging it so listen to the words out my mouth in comparison you don't have a pot to piss in that choose my medium wisely singing in rhyme expressing ideas concisely one word at a time because it's me m-o-l-e and lyrically i'm cow tipping i'm on mp3 while your cds 
is still skipping. Desperate times call for desperate decisions. We'd be cutting beats wide open with the lyrical incision with precision that would make your eyes open wide, make you feel nice and warm, you and fluffy inside, because true. Luscious rhyme on an impeccable time, and we'd be putting words together and they dance just like a feather on the breath of a dancer. Now don't answer me, because this is not like church, you see, even though y'all worship me. Because you just finished your search for the best metaphorical prose you've ever heard. <laughs> Be careful with the money because you might get burned, burned, burned. Oh, nice. Ooh, that's <laughs> great. You, didn't, you couldn't have I just, just come up even, with that. Did I you? just. No. No, that's a whole thing called freestyling, Mary. Freestyling <laughs> is a whole different art. And yeah. I might be a bit ADHD, but I'm not that ADHD. Some guys can come up and some ladies can come up yeah. with. Uh, well, it's off the top of their head. You could just give me a theme and I could go. That's a different intelligence. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, different. Quite different. Yeah. yeah but, amazing. And, and, but I started as a drummer as well. And there's a great tradition in hip hop called human beatboxing. And for any listeners out there who might be on a bus or something and want to act crazy, there's three noises. One is a, p- which is a big F sound after a, p- so. A p- and then there's a second noise, which is a, which is a TS sound. Anyone can do that. So you've got a, p- and, a, and then an inhale breath, both sides of the back of your tongue, like that. So uh-huh. you're creating this circular breathing technique. You're expelling air on the. So that's three inhale breaths in a row. And um, called stereo hand clap, where you're creating two noises at the same time at the back of your um, tongue uh, while, while breathing inwards. So then you've. You've created an, an infinity loop for a beat, which is a. Uh, <laughs> wow. That's great. Wow. That is great. I love that. Great. Of course. Yeah, you know, it is. I, it's a very vaudevillian kind of art form as well. It's very, very vaudevillian art. Oh, that's interesting. Great. Kids love it, and uh, everyone from kids to boomers, everybody loves beatboxing, uh-huh. and everyone can learn it too. So get practicing. Sounds it's hard to sounds dance, tough. though. Nobody realizes that hip hop is really hard to dance. But you know what strikes me about hip hop, and obviously Irish hip hop, is that it's poetry. So talk about poetry again. You mentioned it, and. What do you think good poetry is? Oh, that's, a, that's a really great question. Uh, I think that good poetry is personal. When we let go of the, the metric beat and, uh, and we really make ourselves vulnerable, you know, like as a singer, one is singing and in a sense, one is uh, acting out or, or the song is, is a, a predetermined thing that happens. But with the spoken word, there's all sorts of different intimacies and invitations being made. I'm, uh, I'm aware that this, uh, this conversation is around the beautiful invitation of a third act in life. Um, that sense of uh, re, um, redesign or uh, reimagination of oneself. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I've been lucky enough to work with a great poet, one of the greatest living poets, a man called David White. And so many of his audience, he's a poet from the Pacific Northwest in, in America, and so many of his audience are, uh, are artists of reinvention as well you know, and in the third act of their lives and find themselves flocking toward this spoken word, this poetry, this deeper narrative and invitation. And, uh, and so many of them are so disarmingly simple. You know, all we have to do is speak from the heart. And I'm reminded of a poem by our great poet in Ireland, W.B. Yeats, and uh, it's called, well, he just calls it number four, but it goes, my 50th year had come and gone. I sat a solitary man in a crowded London shop, an open book, an empty cup on the marble tabletop. While on the shop and street, I gazed, my body of a sudden blazed and 20 minutes more or less, it seemed so great my happiness that I was blessed and could bless. Beautiful. My, my 50th can't, can't year beat Yates. Come, <laughs> no, my 50th yeah. year had come and gone. I sat a solitary man in a crowded London shop, an open book, an empty cup on the marble tabletop, while on the shop and street I gazed, my body of a sudden blazed and 20 minutes more or less. It seemed so great my happiness that I was blessed 
and could bless. Mm. And of course, the last line that I uh, was blessed and could bless and the first line, my 50th year had come and gone. I think that those lines um, couldn't happen without one another. I think if Yeats' mm -hmm. 50th year had not come and gone, that sense of bodily um, inflammation, that sense of the consciousness of the divine, really, uh, consciousness of the surreality of life as well, is a great gift uh, once we get into midlife, in my own experience, and, uh, and beyond. And Yeats has another great ode to ageing. Um, and it's called When You Are Old, fittingly enough. And that uh, sounds like when you are old and grey and full of sleep and nodding by the fire. Take down this book and read and dream of the soft look your eyes once had and of their shadows deep. How many loved your moments of glad grace and loved you with love false or true. But one loved the pilgrim soul in you and loves the sorrows of your changing face. And so, bending down beside the glowing bars, murmur a little sadly how love fled and paced upon the mountains overhead and hid its face amid a cloud of stars. Mm. Beautiful. Making me cry. When you are old and grey and full of sleep and nodding by the fire, take down this book and read and dream of the soft look your eyes once had and of their shadows deep. How many loved our moments of glad grace and loved us with love false or true, but one loved the pilgrim soul in you and loved the sorrows of your changing face. And so, bending down beside the glowing bars, murmur a little sadly how love fled and paced upon the mountains overhead and hid its face amid a cloud of stars. So beautiful. Thank you. Um, yeah, how do you advise gorgeous. people to access the artistic part of themselves? Great, 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 great question. It's a courageous, it's a courageous thing. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, uh, seeing it, seeking it out is the key. Uh, I, you know, we all follow the family business in one way or another, or else we run away from the family business. But we know what the family business looks like. We've seen behind the curtain. So if one wants to write poetry or read poetry, then one should seek out the poets live in the room. Uh, we think that uh, the technology is giving us everything, but it is not. Um, the, the, the experience is the experience, but the real experience is us crossing the threshold, seeking out something. So if one wants to unlock that part of ourselves, one, one has to buy the ticket, I suppose, and go and sit uh, and be. Of course, so many of us these days, we just see something advertised, then we YouTube it, and then we decide not to go. Mm. But really, if we don't YouTube it, I remember uh, my mother is a singer and she traveled on circuits, small book uh, circuits for a gr brilliant, legendary company called Sounds True, and they're based in Colorado. Sounds True are a wonderful um, publishing company who do record, uh, audio recordings and online workshops and in-person events and books uh, from all of the new age artists and traditional artists um, and a lot of wellness in the last 30, maybe even 40 years. Mm -hmm. And I'd urge anyone to seek them out. Sounds true. And uh, a wonderful wealth of stuff there. And I always remember my mother traveled a, a, a good bit. Her name is Noreen Nirian. And Noreen Nirian is a singer and a theologian from Ireland. And she traveled a good bit in, in the 90s in, in America on these things called circuits. And many of your listeners will remember circuits. The, these were sold out if, a series of events where people turned up to an evening event or an afternoon event, not knowing what was going to happen. Uh, you would see the flyer, you would see maybe one line describing it and you would buy a ticket and you would go. It's almost unheard of these days <laughs> to go to an event where you didn't know what was going to happen mm -hmm. and or you didn't. You've never heard of this artist. You don't, you're not even sure. You know, so these things called circuits were so healthy and you trusted sounds true or you trusted the organizers, you know, the, the person who's curating this event for you. And one of the curses, of course, of the Internet is that we have to curate our own lives for ourselves. So we're caught in this echo chamber of of uh, 
of our own demise and, and our egos take over. And it's ironically so hard, even though we have Spotify and Apple Music and all of these huge libraries, it's so hard to find new music. Um, whereas our friends know what we'd like, you know, they know the music that we're going to love. And often that's where we find still the best music is through our friends, word of mouth, something that the internet can't, can't get through to or can't compete with, you know, because we all know each other much better than, than Spotify. Mm -hmm. so, um, so in that sense, if one wants to access a creative part of themselves, you go and sit and apprentice oneself in person uh, and make, make yourself vulnerable to that. And, and it does soak in. Mm -hmm. Well, what can Irish traditional song and poetry teach us? Well, uh, the two Yeats poems there, you're openly acknowledging uh, that which can scare you, you know, uh, you're openly acknowledging. And the song I sang earlier, you're openly acknowledging that sense of loss and the sense of, you know, a, a regal posture in that sense of loss, um, that it is you're teaching yourself that it is possible to acknowledge that without it being a completely negative space. Um, mm -hmm. There's another great Irish song, Shul Arun. Shul is the Irish for walk and Arun is uh, my love. Walk, my love. Shul, 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 Arun. Walk, 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 my love. Shul go doris agus shul go kyun. Walk to the door and walk quietly. Um, uh, shul go suhir agus shul go kyun. Walk proudly and walk quietly. Os go de tu mo vurnin slán. Go, my love, farewell. And that's the chorus. It goes, Shul, 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 Arun. Shul go sahir agus shul go kyun. Shul go doras agus eilig lun. As go de antu ma vur nin I'll sell my rock, I'll sell my reel. I'll sell my only spinning wheel. To buy my love a sword of steel. Ask a day and to marvel in slum. Shul, 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 go sahir agus shul, go kyun. Shul, go doras agus eilig lyun. Ask a day and to marvel in slum. Go, my love, farewell. And the beauty in the poignancy, really, of, of letting go. So the Irish, of course, have a monopoly, it seems, on poignancy <laughs> and nostalgia. Yes, I think so. They do. <laughs> could, could you possibly <laughs> read us a portion of one of your poems? Sure I know thing, you, sure. that's a new venture for you. Just give it us, is, yeah, give us a, a little I flavor. Have a, I have a collection of poetry called Early Music mm -hmm. and I use that because I was, it, it's so evocative of the music that was playing that my parents played during uh, during our time together as as as, as a child. Um, but I, I, I did find and I loved this invitation to this podcast because I started looking through uh, the poems with this spectacle of uh, aging, you know, or the reinvention. Mm -hmm. And a couple of poems stood out to me. Uh, there's one uh, that I dedicated to my wife. It's a love poem called First White Hair. And of course, I'm 39. My wife is younger by six years, which is the global average for, 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 for the age gap. Actually, I learned the other day. So I'm very good. It's interesting. But, it's um, exactly the age gap that my daughter and son-in-law have. Exactly. The that's same. exactly. It's weird. I know I got lucky and your son-in-law got very lucky as well. But, um, <laughs> but uh, an age is nothing to do with it. But, uh, but this is First White Hair and it goes, the thought of your eyes, heather brown, make my pale blue eyes glisten. And I wonder how God chose which strand to grant your first white hair. You make an art form of disappearance and teach me that life is second nature. I reach out at your request, finding the strand between my thumb and finger. The stillness while you wait for the pinch of the pluck. Eyes widen as I rip the strand from its root and realize you are determined to live, be free, and love what you love unabashed, like a baby in the shade, gurgling. 
Oh, most alive thing changing before my eyes, let me change with you. Let your white, let your scalp be the loom of my life and let your white hairs weave a seam of double stitching to bind us. Uh. And this white hair I hold is momentous, for it is the last thread I will ever pluck from your head. And letting go of this white hair in the warm and shining sun, I let it go upon the air and turn with time and times begun. Oh. oh, I love that. And it's so romantic. It's so romantic. It's lovely. <laughs> oh. Thank you very much. The stillness oh. while you wait for the pinch of the pluck, eyes widen as I rip the yeah. strand from its root and realize you are determined to live, be free and love what you love unabashed like a baby in the shade, gurgling, oh, most alive thing. Changing before my eyes, let me change with you. Let your scalp be the loom of my life and let your white hairs weave a seam of double stitching to bind us. This strand I hold is momentous for it is the last thread I will ever pluck from your head. Of course, there's that moment when you have to stop plucking white hairs from each other's head Uh or else you'll both be bald. Uh But uh, (laughs) this is the last thread I will ever pluck from your head. And letting go of this white hair in the warm and shining sun, I let it go upon the air and turn with time and times be gone. Oh, thanks. Beautiful. I have chills. (laughs) Eat the loom of my life. Yeah, yeah. And I was actually in an artist studio in New York City and a friend of mine, an artist studio, and she was, she's a, she's a weaver. And uh, there was this large contraption there, you know. And I knew it was called something and I had to Google it. So I'm, I'm complaining about the Internet here, but actually, you know, I use it. <laughs> but um, so I was like weaver instrument, weaver machine. And it said loom. And I was and I was writing this poem right at that time. And um, and of course, the, the, our scalps are mm-hmm. looms, you know, and hold so much information and all the memory, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, biologically, is- you can't get away with anything if someone has a strand of your uh-huh. hair. So. W- what about your favorite song have you sung that or do you have another song that you you can tell us about let me think um i've I've been singing recently uh a great song from the jazz tradition and uh, many of you will know it um and it's called nature boy and it's a great song of, of of finding what's um finding what's important most important and uh and I like to sing it, to sing it through twice, but uh, it, I'll give you a really quick version of it. And um, Nat King Cole, of course, has the, the definitive version of it, but uh, it's a standard. And uh, that goes, there was a boy, a very strange, enchanted boy who said he traveled very far, very far over land and sea. A little shy and sad of eyes, but very wise was he. And then one day, one magic day, he came my way. And though we spoke of many things, fools and kings, this he said to me, the greatest gift. We'll ever learn is just to love and be loved. In return, there was a girl, a very strange, enchanted girl, who said she traveled very far, very far over land and sea. A little shy, but sad of eyes. But very wise was she, and then one day, one magic day, she came my way, and though we spoke of many things, fools and kings, this she said to me, the greatest gift we'll ever learn is just to love and be loved. In return. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah. I always I've loved that song. Oh. Yes, I good. I'm glad, glad you're yeah. familiar with it. Yeah, yeah. I'm very it's familiar. very yeah. A lot of knowledge uh, or a lot of wisdom in it. Yeah. yeah. Wisdom in it. 
Another poem of mine that, that is ripe for those listening who are looking for a, a reinvention or a third or fourth or fifth chapter in their lives is this ode to wisdom. And of course, it's a, an Emily Dickinson style poem. I really wanted to, 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 to mark and pay homage to her and her take, her playful take on wisdom. And um, so I just opened it in a Dickinsonian uh, state and, uh, and it sat down and it's called What to Hand On. Hmm. And a poem of mine from the same collection. What to hand on. I would wish to grow wise ah. through gears of existence. To read the gradient in each phase of life, just to coast down the slopes beyond travailing times. To know the right hat for the right company and rhythm of each interaction, chiming in from the periphery to read the grain of every conversation. To fall in love in the prime of life. Seeds sown of deathbed smiles and waves of well being lap at low tide, imploring your reluctant side to break even one cycle learned as a child. For wisdom knows what to hold and what to hand on, which to give and what to keep, where to dig and what to bury, when to wake and how to sleep. Our wish for wisdom still, a whisper the source of which still buried deep. So soul brother and soul sister, are we changed by what we meet? Mm. I love that poem. Just love it. I would wish to grow wise through the gears of existence, to read the gradient in each phase of life, just to coast down the slopes beyond the travailing times, to know the right hat for the right company and rhythm of each interaction, chiming in from the periphery to read the grain of every conversation, to fall in love in the prime of life. Seeds sown of deathbed smiles and waves of well-being lap at low tide, imploring our reluctant side to break even one cycle learned as a child. For wisdom knows what to hold and what to hand on, where to, which to give and what to keep, where to dig and what to bury, when to wake and how to sleep. Our wish for wisdom still, a whisper the source of which still buried deep so, soul brother and soul sister, are we changed by what we meet. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Actually, this is such a lovely, intimate moment with three of us. But what about when you're on stage? How is that different? How does that feel? It took a, it took a while. Uh, it took a while, Mary. Um, as a younger uh, person, um, I was I had apprenticed myself to stand up comedy and rap and hip hop. And I was a drummer. So I had trained myself to keep things moving. And um, so and humor has always come at me uh, or with me. Like sometimes people laugh at me, even though I wasn't trying to be funny. So I kind of just go along with it. <laughs> it happens to us all, but I think it happens to me a little bit more. And, um, and even Irish people, it's, it's not the accent. It's something different. There's something psychic going on. But I suppose that was indicative of, of a deeper restlessness in me that, you know, being in the body and uh, inhabiting stillness and I suppose translating or transmitting a part of me that took life quite seriously was something that took my midlife, uh, my 40th year has come and not gone yet. Um, and it took me a long time to inhabit that uh, identity. So when you ask me on stage, no problem, no problem. When you ask me when I'm on stage, Inhabiting that stillness was was a very uh, long journey for me, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, one of my missions, actually, when I took up the the mantle of being a poet, was to gain the trust of an audience. So, my goal was, and it took a year or two to create. My goal was after fifteen minutes to look out into an audience of any size; they're often small, um, and see someone with their eyes closed. When someone has their eyes closed and their ears open. Uh, they've you've gained their trust. Uh, they know what you're doing on some primal level and they're entering into it. Um, and that took a long time. So on stage, it feels and I suppose bringing it out to 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 out to us all listening in in the world, inhabiting that stillness and transmitting that part of us that takes the world seriously is a, a natural mode for some of us listening, no doubt. 
but for many of us, it is a challenge. And poetry and song, if, if, if you're so inclined, is a great way of inhabiting stillness. Uh, memorizing, committing something to memory, of course, is, is a great way of inhabiting stillness, uh, working your inner, your interiority, if you will. Um, mm-hmm. Yet, you, when you're reciting something, something different happens in the body. Uh, and you'll know that because you might have it learned 110% when you're on your own. But when you get into a room, even with one other person that you don't know, and try to recite that same thing that you've committed to memory, it will fall apart. Your knees begin to shake, your lips begin to tremble, and uh, and you forget everything. <laughs> um, so there is something. There's something in it, you know, yes. uh, when you're not reading something. So yeah. that's uh, that's how it feels on stage, and that's the gift that that is that I'd like to. I love to garner and grant a permission to people to access, you know, whether it's ancient Irish culture or poetry of any kind. Committing something to memory and reciting something is everybody loves it. Um, I have a poem called The Virtuoso, and I really feel that coming from my, a musical background, you know, I'd have elements uh, of virtuosity in, in, my, in my background. You know, I'm, I'm inexplicably good at some things, I'm very bad at like cleaning the kitchen and things, but, um, <laughs> but other things I'm quite good. And um, so I, coming from virtuosity, but I, I really believe that my virtuosity came from a place of restlessness that I'm bringing into the world. And we're all good at something that we mastered as a defense mechanism in order not to feel something. And uh, my thing was loneliness, you know, sitting in the body, being still. You know, I had to beatbox. I had to, you know, learn songs and I had to uh, get good at drums uh, in order to stave away something. So that virtuosity comes out of a restlessness in us. And um, but when one presents one's virtuosity or one's skills, you can do no wrong. Everyone is so grateful. And I wrote a poem in kind of a, in praise of that, that part of us that we, it's so difficult to access. And it's called The Virtuoso. And it goes, we don't care if you're sorry. We don't care if you're sorry, nor do you even anymore. Why atone for your gifts? Express remorse for your ability, begging pardon in public. Be instead the unrepentant virtuoso, for it is you who chooses to stand, showing us the spirit stir, then fill and overflow within you. The spirit does not ask forgiveness nor permission. The spirit does not ask forgiveness nor permission. And and upon your stage, you can do no wrong. Get out of the way. We love what you have and need no reminder of our sentence here on earth. Please just set us free. Thank you. And what would you like our listeners to have as their main takeaway today? a great question. I'd love, I'd love if, if somebody walked away from this conversation with, 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 with a, an urge to commit something to memory, you know, and recite it, uh, yeah. whether it is a poem or a, or a monologue for those actors out there, even a short one or, um, or a song, you know, to learn the third verse of a song is something that's reserved almost exclusively for singers. Um, everyone's got the first verse, you know, okay. some people have this. Right. But it's only those who have sat up late at night and made notes and stuck it around their kitchen or put it in their phone that has the third verse. Uh, so to do that and then that that uh, that what's the word um, when that humiliation of trying to do something for someone for the first time and it falling apart. Really, the learning is in that. And and then the second time it gets a bit better, the third time you have it and then it's it's a friend for life. So really, I would love if somebody um, connected with their virtuosity, uh, some skill that is born out of uh, a restlessness uh, or a sadness in them, um, and really just to connect with other people. That's that's what I'd love. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Michal, I love that. that. Is, I love that too. I'm absolutely going to do it. And, I'm going to hold you to it, Mary. Mary I do. I'll hold you to it, Mary. I'm going to hold you, yeah. Mary. You're going to have to perform it for me the next time we're oh, on Oh, God. The- yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll do one, too, for you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Michal. Our guest today on Late Boomers has been Michal O'Sullivan, musician and virtuous- virtuosity in his poetry from Ireland.
You can check out his website at touristdanam, that's T-U-R-A-S-D-A-N-A-M.com. His poetry book called Early Music, which I am absolutely going to buy and maybe memorize a few verses. I don't know about the third, but I'll try. <laughs> um, is available on Amazon, or if you can get, or you can get a signed copy on his website. Thank you for being with us today, Mihal. It was wonderful, and this, of course, is via the magic of the internet and all the way from the magic of Ireland. Mm-hmm. And we'd like to remind you, our listeners, to subscribe to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Late Boomers Podcast, where you can watch us. Also, please make sure you're subscribed on your favorite podcast platform so you can take us hiking or cooking with you and never miss an episode. (laughs) Please follow us on Instagram at Late Boomers and at I am Kathy Worthington and at I am Mary Elkins. Our website is lateboomers.biz, that's B-I-Z, if you'd like to drop us a line. We hope we are bringing you a little inspiration and some great information. Thanks again, Michal, for being our guest today. Thank you for joining us on Late Boomers, the podcast that is your guide to creating a third act with style, power, and impact. Please visit our website and get in touch with us at lateboomers.biz. If you would like to listen to or download other episodes of Late Boomers, go to ewnpodcastnetwork.com. This podcast is also available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and most other major podcast sites. We hope you make use of the wisdom you've gained here and that you enjoy a successful third act with your own style, power, and impact.